Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're still on the road to Mac stock. Uh, we'll be shutting it down sometime soon uh, because we'll run out of speakers to talk to. But we're far from that point uh, right now. And I'm always looking forward to these, these sessions because it gives me an idea of some of the topics we're going to hear about and definitely some of the people. This one, though, I'm especially excited about because this is the first appearance on Mac Voices for Mr. David Cohen. David, welcome. It's great to have you. It's great to be here, Chuck. Thanks for inviting me on. Oh, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. And as, as I've been saying to you, I did not realize when we started to do the scheduling that you're in the UK. So I'm sorry for asking you to stay up so late. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. Um, I'm kind of used to it because some of the people I, I work with in the podcasting community are in the US. So I, I've just got adapted to it over the time. So I'm going to use that as sort of the, the place to introduce you. Um, who do you work with in the podcasting community? What kind of things do you do? So um, I work in the uh, MyMac podcasting network, and I do a show with Tim Robertson, who, who runs that network called uh, TechFan. And uh, we've been, well, we've just, just been through our 300th show, so we've been doing it for a few years now. Uh, and it's kind of a, a kind of a very broad-based tech kind of geek fan show type thing. We, we try and keep it fairly light, very conversational, um, sometimes we go if it go off in kind of odd tangents and odd directions, but really, you know, it's it's a show which where we talk about the things we love, uh, and uh, we talk about all sorts of stuff in technology. Um, and before that, I used to do the MyMac podcast, so um, that's also one of the ones, obviously, in in the podcast network over there, and uh, obviously very Apple focused, uh, and I'm kind of very steeped in the whole Apple community. So that's why Mac stock is something that, that I was aware of uh, as soon as it started, and uh, I'm looking forward to being involved with. And of course, you're going to make the trek the whole way over from the UK, which I think says a lot about your enthusiasm. It also says a lot about Mac stock that that it creates that value for you that you want to make that trip. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I came last year uh, just as a participant, and it was a huge amount of fun. Really, really nice community. Uh, kind of a very um, casual but you know, focused feel to it that was that was really a lot of fun it's in a beautiful part of the world and you know woodstock illinois is, is is a lovely place to visit certainly for me from the uk um and so i you know i'd already decided that i wanted to come again this year if i got the opportunity uh and then i was asked to speak as well so um i i got the opportunity to kind of stretch my uh, stretch my um, podcasting muscles on, on a live stage for a change. That's great. That's great. And of course, Tim Tim is a good friend of, of the show. Um, always love what yeah. he does and he's going to be there as well. So you guys yeah. you guys will just have this big uh, my Mac reunion. Yeah, well it's, it's great for us because obviously we you know we talk to each other every week doing the show but we very rarely get a chance to meet so um we're kind of already planning what we're going to be doing and there's other there's other people we know from the community there as well so um yeah it will be kind of a kind of a big kind of um a geek fest which i'm looking forward to as well <laughs> okay so speaking of geek fest um, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to let you talk about the title to your session and what it's about. Mm -hmm. I I found it particularly intriguing, but I don't want to steal your thunder. So, what are you going to be talking about on the main stage? So, I'm talking about the um, the kind of the rise of these little Internet of Things computers, like like the Raspberry Pi, uh, and I'm, I'm basically making a claim that is is the Raspberry Pi the new Apple II uh, because it's uh, a tiny little computer, a real hobbyist computer that, that very much ins inspires me to think about the original Apple II. Um, very flexible, you can do all sorts of things with it. And it really is kind of the perfect uh, hobbyist machine for, for kind of stretching your uh, your creativity and your, your ideas about what you might want to do with a, uh, a small computer. And actually, um, despite the fact it's it's small in size, it's actually pretty powerful as well. So I, I really want to take the opportunity to introduce the uh, visitors to Mac stock to this kind of new, new device and um, kind of explain to them a little bit about what it's all about. I'm sure many people have heard of it, but 
not many people kind of know how easy it is to use or what you can do with it. So uh, I really want to try and open people's horizons to that. I, I, first of all, I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm probably one of those that has a certain amount of misconception of, about the Raspberry Pi uh, because it's it's essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you buy it, it's basically a circuit board. Yeah, exactly. But that's the real beauty of it is that's all it is, which means you're not constrained by a whole load of decisions that the the manufacturers made. You can really do with it whatever you want. Um, and there's a huge community around the Raspberry Pi now. The the the, the idea for the Raspberry Pi came from uh, an, an actually an English computing project from the 80s called the BBC Micro. Um, and back then, the BBC decided they wanted to do um, a series of, of, of TV programs about computing. And so they actually commissioned one of our local UK manufacturers to do a reference design for a computer for them called the BBC Microcomputer. Um, and this thing was a big hit in schools, a big thing, and I remember seeing it everywhere when I was growing up. Um, and the people behind the Raspberry Pi kind of wanted to do that for the new generation. They wanted to create a cheap, small computer that kids could learn to program on because they recognized that most kids nowadays in schools, they kind of learn how to do Word and Excel um, and uh, browse the web, but they don't actually learn how to program, how to actually use a computer as the basis for a, for a natural project. And so they came up with the idea of a, a cheap, um, very flexible computer that actually was just the starting point, and you needed to put a little bit of effort into to try and kind of make it work. And um, that's what the Raspberry Pi is. But the beauty of it is, is that it's so simple, and the support in, from the community is so effective that even if you're a relative rel computing neophyte, you can get up and running with it very quickly. And before you know it, you have a, a kind of a cigarette pack sized computer that's running a full desktop operating system, is running Linux. It can connect to the internet straight out of the box, can do whatever you want. So um, you know, you don't have to be a particular tech head to, to make it do something but if you are or you you become uh, very interested in in doing amazing things with it then before you know it you can be building robots which are driven by raspberry pis you can be um building servers to do specific jobs in your home there's all sorts of things so re really the uh, the sky's the limit in terms of what it can do uh and and it all starts from just that, that little circuit board okay so so i buy this little circuit board and now, now, what do I do with it? And and what I, I guess what most of us are used to, to having a Mac or an iPhone or an iPad. So you've already got a screen. You've already got a keyboard or an input interface of some kind. Yeah. Here you don't have that. So how much how much money do I need to invest to make this a viable thing? No, not very much money at all. I mean, they they really did not want to. Uh, kind of tie you down to a, a loads of proprietary peripherals. So the circuit board as it comes, the Raspberry Pi comes in about four or five different flavors. There's the very cheap one, the Zero, which is uh, starts at five dollars, uh, and then they have um, one with built-in uh, Ethernet Bluetooth that's a little bit more, is about ten dollars, and then kind of the big one is is a whopping twenty-five or thirty dollars, uh, and that is the full system. Um, they have uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. They have between two and four USB ports straight on the board. They have an HDMI output straight on the board. So effectively, if you have a USB keyboard and mouse, uh, um, and, and storage is provided by um, micro SD cards. So if you have uh, access to a micro SD card, you can either buy an SD card with an operating system already on it for uh, a few dollars, or alternatively, if you have another computer, you can just download the files yourself and, and set it up yourself. Um, plug the SD card in. Give it some power via USB. Uh, give it a keyboard and mouse via USB, uh, and um, plug it into an HDMI. Uh, plug it into your TV or plug it into a monitor, and off you go. You don't even need to actually have the monitor because the thing will boot itself up. And if you can then connect to it over a network connection, then you can actually uh, SSH into it, which use a terminal to get to it and actually remotely control it. But uh, obviously, if you've never used a, that sort of computer before, you probably feel more comfortable having the screen on it. Um, and you'll find a full Linux desktop sat there waiting to go with applications ready to go and uh, able to connect to the internet straight away. And uh, off you go. That's as simple as that. If, if that's all you want to do with it, that's absolutely brilliant. You've got a fabulous little computer for about $35, $40. Wow. So I've got, okay, so let's say I spent $35, $40 and I've got this. Um, 
and you talked about kids using this to have kids learn to program. Um, mm-hmm. What if I'm not in a position to want to take the time to learn to program, but maybe I wanted want to make this little thing actually do something useful? Do I purchase programs? Do I input programs from somewhere, or can I copy and paste them, download them from the internet, to to make it turn this little computer into whatever it is that yeah. I want to turn it into? So the first thing you do is fire up your browser and go to the regular Raspberry Pi, um, kind of the site for, for from the manufacturer because they have loads and loads of useful um, hints and and programs and inputs and and that sort of thing that you can you can get to straight from there. But as I said, there's a real really thriving community around around this device. When it was first developed, as I said, it was ideally it was meant it was aimed at education. And I think the manufacturers underestimated the hobbyist demand there would be. And, and the hobbyist demand has really kind of exploded. It exploded straight away. The thing was back ordered for months as soon as it became available. Um, so there's a huge community of people out there who are involved on the official Raspberry Pi sites, but also there's a whole load of other sites. You can get magazines, you can get podcasts, you can get YouTube channels showing you how to do things on it. Um, the uh, the actual system board has a, has a uh, what's called a GPIO port, which is a series of pins you can connect peripherals to. So there's a, a very wide range of um, of peripherals like cameras and motion controllers and all sorts of different sensors and interfaces that you can connect to the Raspberry Pi to, to interface it to other things. Um, and if you want programs, it's running Linux. You can pretty much download anything that is available for Linux has been recompiled for the Raspberry Pi. Um, if you want to play games, then you can uh, download the um, the MAME emulator um, and pretty much play any arcade game or uh, console game that's been available for the last 20 years um, very, very easily. You can um, download um, new operating environments. There's several different operating environments that are available for it. Um, there's a series of uh, kind of development environments to allow you to programming anything as simple as drawing you know structured programs using scratch I mean, that's the sort of thing that, that's aimed at kids all the way up to uh, you know full kind of linux uh, development environment using uh, c++ if, if that's what you want so um what's great about the raspberry pi community is there's something for pretty much every level of computer user right from the uh, somebody who's never done it before all the way up to, to guys who you know they really just want a cheap computer to run a, a web server or something like that on. So you could even run a web server off this. Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, you can get builds if you, if you want. Um, a lot of people worry about security nowadays, and they want to be able to connect to their home from outside their home. You can get a, a, a pre-built open VPN server that's trivial to install on Raspberry Pi. Plug that into your network, and all of a sudden you have a server on your network that will allow you to securely and encryptedly connect from anywhere in the on the internet to your home, uh, download files, access your home router, that sort of thing. Um, as easy as you want. You can use it to control Wi-Fi access points if you want to run the enterprise on Wi-Fi access points. So you can set up different SSIDs so your kids can't, um, you know, go browsing things you don't want them to browse to or take all your bandwidth. Then you basically you can buy extra access points and, and have Raspberry Pi running as a server to actually control all of that. A lot of people use them as media servers as well. So they plug a big USB hard drive into the side of it uh, and then they use Plex or um, – uh, Kodo or any of the other media servers to actually stream media off that um, Raspberry Pi to their TVs in their house or to other devices like tablets in the house. Uh, and it's brilliant for all of that sort of thing. So I want to make sure that, that that we don't scare people. I mean, we're talking about running Ooh. servers and, and you know, yeah. doing setting up VPNs. And, you know, that's not what this is about. This is about, you know, having this this power, learning a little bit, having a little fun with it, and not having to spend a ridiculous amount of money. Absolutely. I mean, the, the people like to run servers because it's, it's a cheap and powerful way of doing something like that. But if you don't want to do any of that, if you really want to use it to learn, it's it's also probably the best computer you can get for learning how to play around with Linux or learning how to um, program or even just kind of, you know, playing around with a computer if you've never used a computer before. You know, the cheapest entry-level computer you go out and buy is going to be a few hundred dollars. This is $25, $30, and it, it runs a modern powerful um, desktop environment which has uh, office and, and email and web and everything built into it because that's all built into the Linux distribution. Uh, you don't have to touch the command line or do anything complicated with it at all if you don't want to. It literally just 
fires up and there you go and off you can you can go learning how to how to use it so uh, again if you want to buy a computer for a kid i think rather than buying a um you know an, a more expensive windows computer or a mac um if you if you know they, they're just trying to fill themselves out into, into what they want what they want to do with the computer and this is a great way to go um and you can you know if they break it if they try and do something with it that burns it out um you know, they lose it or something like that then you're not talking about a huge investment of money so uh, i think that that has a kind of an attraction as well it's come to that that we now have a computer small enough that we could lose <laughs> absolutely <laughs> raspberry pi zeros is, is literally half the size of a credit card um so you do have to kind of keep track of it um but most people put them in a little case and Kind of mount them somewhere and, and they kind of know what they're doing but yes absolutely you can you could quite easily lose one of these things if you weren't careful <laughs> david there there are a million questions i want to ask you about this and that would entail yeah. us having you do your session right here so we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're gonna stop here um but yeah it, it sounds it sounds really intriguing and i think if you know it's it's one of the great things about max stock that it stretches you out maybe in an area that you haven't thought about but for that kind of investment, you know, who wouldn't want to play with some of this stuff just to see if you can get it to work? And you learn some stuff, some stuff along the way as well. Absolutely. And, and as I say, I think the reason I chose this particular theme for this talk is that it does, it, to my mind, bring back to, in, to, to meet those hobbyist days of the Apple One and the Apple Two, when <clears throat> people would come to a, a, a meeting like Mac Stop so to meet like-minded individuals and just war stories about what they were doing with these computers and to me the fact that you can do that but instead of investing the hundreds of dollars that you had to back then which was a substantial amount of money back in those days you can now you know you now do it with effectively with with uh, kids pocket money i think shows how far we've come uh, and really shows the potential for the future in that uh, you we can now get um, computing hardware that yeah, it's not going to run rings around the the latest laptops or Mac Pros or, or high-end workstations, but it's more than powerful for doing 90% of what anybody will want to do with a computer. Um, and, and the limitation is only their imagination in terms of what they're able to do with it. And I think that's very, very exciting. Yeah. And and we we all continue to chase that 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 myth of power and and that you need to buy the bigger, the faster, the better. We're all susceptible to it. And yet, as you said, 90% of what all of us do, we could probably do on this um, or, you know, a, a very simple Mac, uh, early model Mac. Um, but, yeah. you know, that's so, so yeah, definitely something that it's, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing just how you're going to present it, what you can, what you can do and see how many people you can encourage to get into this. It's going to be fun. Yeah. It, it is going to be fun. I'm going to bring a few with me and uh, have them set up in the uh, demo area as well, so people can have a have a play around. And yeah, it should be it should be a, an an interesting thing. I I hope it will pique people's interest. Terrific. Well, between now and then, if people want to get in uh, get in touch with you, maybe ask some questions that you can answer then, or ask you more than we cover here. What's the best way to find you? So you can get you can email me at, at the Tech Fan Podcast. Our email address there is the show at techfanpodcast.com. Or alternatively, if you want to get hold of me directly, probably best to reach me through my Mac, which is David Cohen at mymac.com. And you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at David B. Cohen. Great. David, it's a real pleasure. I look forward to seeing you at Mac Stock and hearing more about the Raspberry Pi and probably showing out a few bucks to get involved in this sounds like <laughs> sounds like yeah, it's another one that's going to cost me money <laughs> <laughs> yeah fortunately only a little bit of money this time around but yeah. uh but yeah maybe, maybe i should bring a few along to sell <laughs> yeah there you go there you go pay for your trip <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well we'll see you in woodstock uh in in july yeah i'm looking forward to it. i'll see you then Folks, we hope you, we will see you in Woodstock uh, in July. That's why we're doing the Road to Mac Stock. We want to give you a taste of what's going to be there, who's going to be there, the kind of things you can learn. So please, MacStock2017.com. Check it out. Join us. You're going to have a blast for the weekend. I guarantee it. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes, links to subscribe, and to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, the Mac Voices blog, the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and on Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard that helps you do more with your Apple tech. 
Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.